Hello, I'm Andrew Neil, and this is The Backstory, a series of in-depth interviews with people who have the power to shape events and to influence our understanding of them. This week, I'm joined by a man who's been described as Europe's most powerful ambassador. Wolfgang Issinger was chair of the influential Munich Security Conference from 2008 until 2022, a forum he transformed from an annual gathering of foreign policy wonks into a year-round travelling circus that attracts global elites and world leaders. He's also been Germany's ambassador to the United States and the United Kingdom. In this interview, we discuss his country's historic shift in security policy since Russia's invasion of Ukraine and how committed it is to it and his career as a power broker around the world. This is the backstory from Tortoise. Wolfgang Ischner, you wrote that Chancellor Schultz's address to the German parliament on February the 27th was a watershed in German foreign policy. Billions more for defence, sanctions against Russia, even weapons for Ukraine. But since then, he's been rowing back on a lot of that. Is it really such a watershed? Well, it is. A significant number of established beliefs, traditional beliefs, uh, fundamental elements of German foreign policy were kicked overboard by that speech. No weapons into crisis regions is one of them. Uh, no weapons deliveries, uh, uh, certainly into Ukraine, that was a firmly established principle. Uh, and certainly within the, 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 the governing party, the SPD, the appreciation of raising the defense budget in, a, in any significant manner was... Uh, was not well developed. So uh, uh, Olaf Scholz did uh, throw overboard a significant number of established convictions. And I would not actually agree with you that he has not followed up. I think what, what we've seen in the two months following that speech is that uh, Olaf Scholz uh, is not really a... a a particularly gifted communicator. I would certainly grant you that. He could have done significantly better in communicating not only to the Germans, but to the world and certainly to the Ukrainians that Germany has been one of the principal uh, money givers to Ukraine for the last eight years. That seems to have totally disappeared from, the, from our radar screen. Um, we have actually uh, offered weapons and all sorts of military equipment. And here again, I would grant you that Germany didn't lead, but sort of came late, came after others had cleared the air, cleared the way for it, etc. So you can, I think it's fair to say that Germany was struggling with these decisions, which is not surprising if you know where, the, where, where we'd been coming from. So Germany has been communicating badly, but but our performance, I would claim, was not quite as bad as it sounds. Well, let's look at that performance because my question wasn't about the speech itself. I, I understand yeah. the content of the speech was a watershed. It's what's happened in the two months since. Uh, is that really amount to a watershed? After all, the Chancellor himself went through the list of weapons for Ukraine and he personally removed every item of heavy equipment that Kyiv had requested, including tanks and artillery. Uh, he cut a package that was worth about a billion euros to about 300 million euros. I mean, that's hardly a watershed. Again, I would grant you that we were hesitating and uh, this chancellor is known for his habit of not making announcements until he can really um, declare that he has studied all the details. For, I'll give you an example. He would not announce that we would deliver such and such uh, equipment unless he knows that we can also deliver the, the ammunition in, in meaningful, you know, uh, in meaningful numbers uh, or the spare parts, etc. So uh, I would I would insist it's more a communications issue, but I think it is also, of course, an important 
uh, issue for a newly elected chancellor of Germany to make sure that he can tell the Germans that he is uh, reflecting with his partners and advisors about the question, how far is it okay for us to go? Where would the point be where we, we would unnecessarily provoke some kind of escalatory reaction by the Russians? That certainly would would reduce the opportunity for Ukraine to prevail. Finally, uh, let me simply say, Andrew, of course, don't mistake me as a spokesperson for the no, uh, I understand that. Olaf Scholz government. I've criticized this government for, for coming in late and for reacting not quickly enough, and certainly for not leading. But I would, I, def, I would defend it when it comes to the question, are we doing a lot less than all the others are doing? Well, we're, we're doing not a lot less. We're, we're, we're trying to do more. Uh, our, one of our problems, of course, is that the Bundeswehr, our army, our uh, armed forces, have been so depleted over the last decade or more. And that is, of course, not a, a, a fault to be, to be accredited to Olaf Scholz. That is the fault of previous administrations, previous defense ministers, previous chancellors, etc. Uh, that there is very little available that we can uh, make make available to uh, Ukraine from our armed forces. Because well, uh, no, I understand we, used to have, we used to have thousands of tanks sure. uh, in the early nineties. Now we have just a couple. Right. We're down a couple of hundred. But the uh, and the German defense minister said that they couldn't send heavy weapons because it would leave Germ Germany vulnerable because you've got so few at the moment. I mean, given that the Russian military is bogged down in Ukraine, where exactly is the current military threat from G to Germany? Well, let's be serious about this. Uh, there are obligations by all NATO members to meet uh, the requirement uh, standards that have been established by NATO, each country is supposed to make available to NATO uh, such and such numbers of uh, tanks, equipment, airplanes, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But Germany has not done that for years. Well, yes, of course we have, and and we're even taking the uh, the leadership of the um, you know of the forward de uh, deployed task force, and for for doing that, Germany needs to make sure that we have the necessary number of, of, of equipment, of weapons, of tanks, et cetera, et cetera, uh, for our armed forces to deploy uh, for our own defensive purposes and for the defense of NATO. So uh, it is a meaningful discussion to have. No, I understand um, that. Can we, deplete, can we deplete our resources because we believe that our security is currently being defended in and by Ukraine? Well, to a certain extent, I would say that's true. But how far are we going to go responsibly in um, drawing down our own, uh, you know, military resources that are supposed to to defend NATO as such and our partners and ourselves? So this is this is not an easy decision to make. I guess the thing that surprised me as someone who watches German politics, admires German politics is that when even the Greens want to take a tougher line, even the Greens want to send heavy weapons, then surely the Chancellor should get on with it. The Chancellor has a party establishment behind himself, which uh, is, not the, is not identical to the Green uh, Party spokespersons. You are absolutely right. It is almost a miracle. <laughs> That the Greens, that the Greens, who found it almost impossible to support our military activities, you know, remember in Kosovo in 1999, when Germany participated in the NATO intervention in Kosovo, the Greens had an extremely hard time agreeing Indeed. to our active uh, air participation. We did participate, and the Greens um, hesitatingly accepted it. It is almost a miracle to see how far the Greens have come around to uh, some, of, some of the spokespeople of the Greens are among the fiercest proponents, proponents of delivering more and more heavy weapons, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So that is, if you ask me, a, a, a fantastic uh, development of the Green Party 
But the Social Democratic Party, which is, of course, a much older party, finds it far more difficult to um, to uh, uh, review their longtime, uh, of course, pacifist tradition. The idea that uh, that has been a, a trademark for the Social Democrats, we will, through Ostpolitik, create stability and peace in Europe without weapons. Die Welt, one of uh, Germany's most respected newspapers, says that Mr. Schulz's delays, prevarication in these matters is, quote, the most dangerous miscalculation in the history of the Federal Republic. That is a stark uh, exaggeration. We have communicated extremely badly. Uh, many of my Ukrainian friends shake their heads. So we're, we're lagging behind. But we are catching up. We're trying to catch up, and we we and I think there is a growing consensus in Germany that those uh, are making the right point who argue that our own defense, our own security, I mean of Western Europe, is currently being defended in and by Ukraine, and that is why Ukraine deserves to be protected and supported as best we can. And I think that is a growing uh, consensus. And finally, let me make this point. You know, whether Germany or any other European NATO partner delivers 20 more Gepards or Marders or other types of equipment is not going to change the final outcome of this conflict. Well, what really, we, we, what really it, matters... It, it might. What we, well, what really matters is what the big guy is doing, what the United States has been doing in terms of making funding available for years, for years, not only since the 27th of, or 24th of February, for, for a long period of time. So I think the decisive uh, element in this support activity by NATO, by the West, is what the U.S. is doing. I think what where Germany can maybe start leading more than it has been in this weapons delivery uh, affair uh, will be the question of what exactly are we, the West, the European Union, uh, et cetera, what are we going to be able to do once the time has come to start rebuilding the destroyed cities, the destroyed infrastructure, et cetera, of Ukraine? Can we put together a huge uh, program that actually works and that will be made available quickly in order to help Ukraine recover from the devastation, from the destruction. I think that's the kind of stuff where I think you will see that Germany can take and probably will take a lead. I think the reason why people in Germany and people in other European uh, capitals, who are Germany's friends, are exasperated, is that, to a big extent, it is German money that has built the Russian war machine because of the oil and gas that you buy, and you're still buying that oil and gas, and therefore you're still financing the war machine of the Kremlin, but you're not moving quickly to help the Ukrainian war machine fight back. I think it is that distinction, that difference that exasperates people. Well, you know, once again, I'm not the spokesperson for the current German coalition government. Uh, but I think what you are saying now is, is, is quite unfair, really. We have made significant strategic mistakes in the past. I'll grant you that. Our dependence... On, uh, on, on Russian gas and oil, especially the, the, the construction of the Nord Stream 2 pipeline, was surely, with hindsight today, a, a major strategic error. But you were warned at the but, time. Many voices warned you at the time that this would increase your dependence yes, on uh, Russian gas. And yet, even after the annexation of Crimea by Mr. Putin, you went ahead with Nord Stream Two, you don't need I, hindsight to have known that was wrong. Well, uh, I would uh, agree with you. Uh, I I started criticizing the Nord Stream two 
a, a pipeline idea beginning, uh, you know, five, six years ago. I thought it was, um, it was no, no longer appropriate to even increase our degree of dependence on, uh, uh, on Russia. But let's not forget, once again, that uh, while Germany is, of course, the biggest country that relies so heavily on Russian gas and also, to some degree, on Russian oil, it is certainly not the only country in the EU. It is now agreed in Germany. No one will dispute what you just said, that this was a strategic error. Uh, but, you know, in order to understand why this was deemed at the time the right thing to do was the conviction that prevailed throughout the German political establishment that because the Soviet Union uh, consistently, even at the height of the Cold War, delivered gas and oil reliably mm. without ever using it as a political weapon. Uh, and then, of course, the Soviet Union participated in granting us reunification. And then we had, together with our allies, the idea of partnership with Russia. Let's not forget, you know, on the floor of my conference, the Munich Security Conference, in February of 2009, that was a year after the, the Russian war in, in with Ukraine, uh, the vice president of the United States, Joe Biden at the time, pushed what he called the reset button with the Russian Federation in order to launch new sets of negotiations. In other words, we were all singing from the wrong song sheet at the time. And maybe the Germans were particularly late in beginning to understand that Mr. Putin had entirely different intentions. Uh, I certainly share the view that we uh, we should have recognized years ago that this was not going to go and uh, this was not going to end well, and that we should we should have diversified uh, more. But let me also say that when Nord Stream One was uh, discussed twenty years ago, I was at that, that time a senior official myself in the uh, German government. Um, not one voice that I remember came up and said, this is the wrong thing. Everybody agreed that it was a good idea to involve Russia, even in downstream oil and gas business, because Russia, uh, now that the Soviet Union had disappeared, was going to be a, a benevolent partner for us. Yes, and, um, that, that may took too long. It took, took too that long. That may have been a reasonable view twenty years ago. I understand. Exactly. I understand that. I mean, it may or it may not have been, but the fact is that Angela Merkel and many others were still prepared to do business with the Kremlin and Mr. P Putin, even as Russian tanks went into Georgia, Crimea, Eastern Ukraine. Even when it was clear what you thought 20, year ago, 20 years ago wasn't true, you still did it. And it wasn't just Angela Merkel, though she was mostly in the public eye associated with it. I mean, is this not a crisis for the whole governing German political class now? Uh, I mean, even Gerhard Schroeder, uh, perhaps your country's most famous Putin apologist, he said, we all went along with this for 30 years. You were all in it. You were all complicit. Uh, that's not quite fair and it's historically not quite correct. In 2014, after the illegal annexation of Crimea and after the beginning unrest and, and Russian involvement in, in, in Donbass, America told Europe, you handle it yourself and you negotiate uh, with Putin, which is what Angela Merkel and, uh, uh, and President Hollande at the time started when they went to Minsk and started the Minsk process with full support from everybody else. I do not recall any single voice uh, from within the European Union or from within NATO, certainly not from the United States, that said in 2014 or 2015, just abandon the negotiations and let's just throw sanctions at the, uh, at the Russians. The, the hope was, today we know it was an unfulfillable hope, but the hope was that, in fact, we would be able to to find a negotiated settlement, certainly for the Donbass problem, and maybe in the longer term also 
for the uh, Crimea problem. Remember the sanctions debate which we had in 2014, 2015. Uh, Europe was at that time, uh, here I want to defend the German track record, Europe was led by Angela Merkel's determination when it came to the sanctions. Everybody thought at the time uh, the EU will fall apart over the sanctions issue. Not every, uh, not every country, including Italy itself, would support uh, these types of sanctions, which we started to, uh, uh, to approve uh, in 2014 and 2015. We did hold the EU together. The, these sanctions never fell apart. And, and, and why didn't they fall apart? Because Angela Merkel's government was uh, strongly leading this effort. But, now, but, but as you, as, excuse me, as you went for these sanctions, you were also making plans to buy more Russian hydrocarbons, billions of euros of more, which far outweighed any sanctions that the Kremlin would face. I mean, I guess my point is that the predicament you find yourself in now is entirely of your own making. You didn't have to become reliant on Russian hydrocarbons. You took decisions that made it so. When your assumptions about Mr. Putin's Russia turned out not to be true, you doubled down, even after the annexation of Crimea, even after the occupation of the Donbass. And I guess that's why people think now that it's incumbent on Germany, as it is on all of us, but especially on Germany now, to do more than it is to help Ukraine and to get off the Russian hydrocarbon drip feed more quickly than it is. Your Honour, <laughs> Your Honour, may I respectfully disagree? Of course. You, see, you speak, what, what you say seems to imply that by um, approving of this Nord Stream 2 project, even after the Crimean annexation, Germany increased its dependency. The fact of the matter is the Nord Stream 2 pipeline is now dead in the water. Not a single ton of oil or gas has flown through this. Uh, of through course, this but only thing. because of the invasion and, of Ukraine. Well, okay, okay. I'm simply saying that there is no increase of the available transport lines uh, uh, from Russia to Germany over the last decade or so. The only pipeline that exists uh, is Nord Stream 1. And as we speak, I mean, let's just, you know, let's, let's look at the facts. As we speak, the Russian Federation, Gazprom, delivers gas and oil through pipelines transiting Ukraine. Ukraine gets the revenue from the transit fees as we speak today, tomorrow, next week. Uh, Germany pays for the, uh, for the gas and has actually negotiated uh, successfully with Russia a year ago, to uh, a year and a half ago, that uh, uh, Russia would continue to use the, 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 the trans-Ukraine pipeline at least until 2024. So, uh, simply to say that w the, the, the German side has not entirely ignored um, the Ukrainian aspect of the problem. Uh, uh, sometimes I ask myself, why hasn't somebody uh, discovered the idea of maybe blowing up the, the pipeline that runs through uh, Ukraine and therefore depriving the, the Russians from the revenue? Fact of the matter is, Ukraine does uh, receive the transit fees, which are quite substantial as we as we speak. So things are sl a slightly more complicated than simply, you know, German business disregarding the interests of others and stupidly relying on Russian supplies. You've had Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov several times at the Munich Security Conference. Did it achieve anything by having him there? Well, let's let's talk about the purpose of the Munich Security Conference. Uh, the Munich Security Conference is a private uh, institution. It's a foundation which I created a few years ago. So we're independent. We're totally independent of any government, including. I, I understand the that. One. 
uh, where our, our funding comes from all sorts of companies and foundations and institutions from around the world. So I have held the conviction that if this conference, if this meeting, this annual meeting is supposed to make any sense, we need to have on stage not only the folks who, whose views we applaud, but we need to have on stage the folks that we don't like at all. And I, I understand that. I was simply I, asking, did it well, achieve okay. anything? Did it achieve? Well, I'm, not, I'm, well, I'm, 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 well, I'm not making a criticism about you having them there. <laughs> that's that's up to you. And I said a conference that only had people who all agreed with each other were pretty boring. I've been to many of them myself, and they are boring. My question was, did it achieve anything? Well, the question is, uh, is, is the participation of a Russian government speaker or two or three is that supposed to achieve anything tangible at a at an event which is an informal event like the uh, like the Munich Security Conference? My answer would be no, and that's not the purpose of it. I cannot claim that Mr. Lavrov's personal participation led to any change in Russian behavior at all. Okay. Absolutely, okay. I would. I have no illusions about. This. I understand that. But, can you see? Then, can you see a yeah, time okay. when he b would be? Welcome back. Well, again, let me go, let me take a step backward. I have tried so far without success to invite a North Korean representative, senior to, to Munich. My own government strongly advised me not to do that because they, they thought that if uh, some North Korean personality showed up in Munich, they would only use this platform for propaganda purposes. A decade ago, I heard the same uh, complaint when I started inviting the Iranians. Mm. And I've had the Iranian foreign minister or his deputy, etc., in, in Munich for, for many years. I defend this decision because if our governments, including yours, uh, negotiate day and night with Iran over this nuclear deal, why should we not allow the international foreign policy community to listen to the Iranian view if we listen to the, to the Russian view, to the Chinese view, to the, the British view, et cetera. Let's hear what the Iranians have to say. That's that's my conviction. That's right. the purpose of so, this So after everything, so, that's, I would, so would he be I invited would, back? It's a simple question. Would you yeah. invite him back or not? Well, I would invite him back not as long as the war is going on. No, but afterwards, but, after but all the, the rape but the moment, and mutilation but the, and murder and but the moment, bombing. The moment there is a uh, ceasefire or a peace arrangement, whatever the nature of it may be, I would think it extremely important to have uh, the Russians um, to listen to, to the Russians. I don't think we can usefully um, I, I totally isolate uh, Russia. They are a permanent member of the UN Security Council. Your ambassador is going to be sitting with this person. Uh, yes, every but we, day, we, every we have day. no choice on that. All members of the Security Council have no choice. You have a exactly. choice whether you want to invite the foreign minister of a genocidal state to your conference. That's your choice. Well, we've had uh, foreign ministers and even prime ministers of genocidal people. I've negotiated myself for months with uh, Mr. Milosevic and, and other people who were accused of genocidal behavior. Uh, and I would certainly not, uh, not, 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 not like or appreciate the presence of genocidal people. But look, diplomacy uh, is not the art of having lunch with your friends. Diplomacy is the art of negotiating with your enemies, trying to prevent so, uh, future uh, outbreaks. Of I understand conflict. that, but but don't we learn anything? I mean, after 20, 30 years, according to Mr. Schroeder, of trying to think that you could deal with the Russian bear, that if you got close to it, you could control it or civilize it or stop it from invading other countries. And that has been a total failure, as we can see every night on our TV screens. You still want to deal with that regime? I'm not saying don't deal with Russia, but you still want to deal with the Putin regime after what's happened? Well, I certainly hope that the Putin regime will uh, be gone before too long. Mm. I would, uh, I think his 
His term runs until 2024. That's two more years. Well, he'll we'll extend see. that. You and I know that. He can extend well, we, it for as long well, as he, he's already do we, done that. Well, do we know that? We don't know that, do we? We'll see uh, what happens. Uh, my conviction is we need to talk even to the worst enemies uh, at, in this informal uh, uh, in, in this is informal framework. Uh, but we don't need to give them um, a, a stage to propagate their infamous uh, uh, propaganda and their genocidal activities. So for the time being, I see no, no neither a reason nor a necessity um, to, to organize meetings that it would include Russia. Let's assume that what that Mr. Schultz's speech to the uh, the Bundestag on the twenty seventh of February is a watershed. It's where we began. Where does that take German foreign policy now in in the twenty twenties? Where where does German foreign policy now go? What different direction do you see it going in? I would mention two things. First, uh, we will, of course, um, and we are in the process of doing that. We will change rather substantially, uh, our defense arrangements. We will be spending significantly more on defense going forward. And there's consensus That's, on doing that now? I think there's a there's maybe not complete consensus. Where, where in politics is there no, complete but consensus? But there's a clear but majority in the Bundestag. But there's a clear majority in the Bundestag. Even the opposition strongly supports this. So I think that is almost a given. Second... I would hope, and this is more a hope than a certainty when I say that, I would hope that one of the, as one of the consequences of this disastrous experience of, of the Russian aggression, uh, we would, Germany would, make a renewed effort to uh, help turn the European Union into a more respected and responsible foreign policy actor, including with the security and defense component. I think this is absolutely absolutely for our survival as Western Europe, absolutely necessary. Just imagine, uh, Andrew, for a moment, where we might be if Donald Trump had been reelected and if Donald Trump had told the Russians, why don't you take, you know, you've taken Crimea, why don't, why, don't, why don't you take Odessa? I don't give a damn. Um, Fortunately, we have at this moment an American president who is a committed transatlantic Atlanticist. He happens to be a personal friend of mine. I have great respect for Joe Biden, but we have no guarantee that the next American president will share these types of convictions. So, indeed, Europe. Yeah. Well, you Europe might get you will, might get Mr. Trump back again. Voila! <laughs> which is why we need to do a lot more to prop up European self-defense capabilities. And I don't think that the solution to that is by, you know, creating a strong German defense and the strong French defense and the strong Spanish defense. I think that we should pull our resources more in Europe. Don't you need Britain as an ally in that as well? It is still the most powerful military machine. Well, I would hope, and I've said this, I've written about it uh, as a former ambassador to, uh, to London, I would hope that we could overcome the, you know, the Brexit created gulf between the EU and, and, and Britain and, and make arrangements for a renewed relationship in the area of foreign policy, security, and defense. Of course, we need the UK. Without the UK, Europe is only half as much, half as, uh, as much worth in terms of security and defense as we would be with the United Kingdom, even if it's not going to be a member of the EU, as a as a, the closest possible partner and so and supporter, yes, indeed. And, and I, I think, and, and I think there is a constituency in that for Britain. Uh, I as hope well. so. Even among the Brexiteers, I think there could be that. But you you let me finish on a, a, a what I think is a very important, almost the defining question for Europe, because you talk of the need for Europe to do more in its own defence. 
that it yes. probably can't always count on America, that there is a pivot to the Pacific going on. It could be Mr. Biden is the last Atlanticist president. We don't know, but he, he, he might be. But how do you do that? How does Europe, particularly the EU, give itself far greater strategic defensive capabilities when it can't even meet its current NATO commitments? I mean, it surely cannot do that without diluting its uh, role in NATO even more. It can't do both. Uh, I think it can do both. Uh, I, I don't think this is an either or. I think that if, for example, take the, the example of Germany. If Germany defend, uh, spends actually regularly 2% or more of its, uh, of its GNP on defense, that increased defense budget will allow Germany not only to meet, of course, NATO requirements, it would also uh, ma make it possible for, for Germany to be a major contributor to a, you know, Euro European base. So we need to make sure that whenever there is no availability of NATO as the principal framework for our defensive arrangements, uh, we need to be able to act on our own in order to defend our fundamental interests as Western European nations with shared borders and shared interests. Um, and we cannot, and you made, you made the point yourself, we cannot eternally rely on the fact that uh, for some miraculous reason, the United States president will always, in all eternity, uh, hold their you know, protective umbrella over the uh, the entire uh, you know number of of European nations. That is, that's been a wonderful um, um, a gift to to Europe. It allowed us to grow over the last half century, et cetera, et cetera. But we should not think that this is going to be a God given arrangement. And we should and we should make sure that the European Union can build the capacity to defend itself. Wolfgang Ischinger, thank you for joining us and maybe we'll get a chance to meet in better times at the Munich Security Conference. Thank you very much. Thank you. I certainly hope so. It was a pleasure talking to you and thank you very much. Bye-bye.